Welcome back to the latest late episode of ET with GOTB. This is a bit of a reaction type podcast to, of course, Ireland versus England, the GOTB derby. No running our order, just vibes. So, you ready? <laughs> I'm, I'm ready. I'm Rachel. I'm Sophie. And this is Extra Time with Girls in the Ball. I'm allowing you to have a phone in case you need to call upon some results. I but don't. Knowing you, you've got it all inside that, that lovely <laughs> head of yours. I sound really cocky there. <laughs> <laughs> it did. <laughs> it's very rare for you. Um, no, we're here for a bit of a recap of the international break, the big one, the first time, Ireland versus England. We have our tea, we have our coffee. It's Thursday morning, back in from Dublin yesterday. Um, impossible to do a pod on Monday, wasn't it? Yeah, we were just running around the place. Um, Rachel was marching us around Dublin on a tour, um, literally at the speed of light because it was raining. And uh, we, like, there were two sections of the group and Rachel was racing ahead with her blue tartan umbrella and we were trying to follow along in the background. Sophie's being very dramatic. Um, I did I'm not though. <laughs> I did have a difficult decision to make that morning when I woke up and collected our friends from the airport and it was just rained, 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 rained all day. And I know I make jokes that it rains a lot in Ireland, but like, not like every bloody hour of the day. Um, so I just decided they can suck it up. We'll grab some brollies. We'll do a quick march through Dublin and we'll finish in Temple Bar. And I think that was we it. We had fun. We had fun. It was a good day. Good day all around. Met up with some of the other um, journalists from over here. Had a nice dinner, a few pints of Guinness and uh, got ourselves good and ready for the game on yeah. Tuesday. Which, I don't know about you, but like, I feel like I very much live day to day and probably don't often give myself time to think about sometimes like the magnitude of games, like even things like the World Cup final. Do you know that kind of way where you, we were just like, when we've got work and stuff, you're so focused on the things we need to be doing during the day that sometimes you don't think about how you feel about something? Yeah, I, th I think it was a weird, a really weird one. For, for both of us, I guess, emotionally on on Tuesday, because obviously, first time that we've ever had this, like, game where we're on different sides, well, on different sides, <laughs> but um, also the fact that, you know, I've obviously wanted England to win, but I have a great affection for the Ireland team, and I found that a bit, like, weird um, to deal with, because, yeah, the emo no normally when I watch England, I'm, like, fully, like, Obviously wanted them. I don't know how to. If I'm I was the same because, like, obviously, it's like this weird, like, tearing of my. Yeah, watching England play. <laughs> I kind of had a slightly different watching England play at the other game. I want them to win, mm. and then watching them play Ireland, I was like, God, they're really annoying. Why should stop? Like, why are you bringing on like Beth Mead and Fran <laughs> Kirby? Like, that's so unnecessary. <laughs> or like, celebrate your goal more, Lauren James. Like, God's sake. Um, it was. I found it really interesting how I could be so polarly opposite in the game because I'm so used yeah. to seeing the lionesses and supporting them. I but when I'm watching Ireland, I'm like heart and soul in there. Yeah, no, so I definitely, like, of, of course wanted England to win, but I'm, I think actually the result was the best kind of result. I think you probably deserve to go and we'll go into that in a minute, I guess, but the fact that it was pretty, you know, it wasn't a heavy win or loss either way. I think it was, you know, quite competitive especially in that second half England controlled the first half but um the fact that it didn't England didn't run away with it I think was the best thing so for me the fact that they won brilliant but the fact that it wasn't like a there was a lot of respect there and within the island that they can take away from yeah for it. sure and um you know we thought about doing a, a pre kind of pod on Tuesday but then we both got called into off the ball um the crowd over there who does a huge amount of sport in Ireland um and I've been on a few times with them uh, but they had you on. They wanted to chat to both of us, learn a little bit more about us. Very early start for us. You also had the Guardian pod to do as well. Um, so that day just ran away from us a bit. But it was a really nice preview. Um, and I think I think when I saw England get that second penalty, I thought, oh, God, they're going to run away with the tear and we're going to look very stupid on off the ball. But actually, it turned out, I think I predicted 2-1. Um, I think a 2-1 result would have been a fair result. I think Ireland at least deserved a goal, but um, yeah. I think we looked we looked all right after that because we, we thought... We didn't look stupid, so that's amazing. <laughs> we hoped it would be close. We thought it would be close. We uh, we hoped Denise Sullivan maybe would get into the game a bit more. I think England did really well, nullifying her impact. Uh, and we did talk a little bit about Katie McCabe trying to do, you know, drag the team through it a bit as well. We talked about Megan Campbell's long throw, which I always love. Like, we all know about Megan Campbell's long throw in the women's game, but... 
when you get new fans in and then suddenly they get introduced to it and you just see it go viral again, it's it's amazing. Like I love the Aviva Stadium. Um, it's a really, really nice stadium. We were there for Ireland versus Northern Ireland in September, um, which was a really fun game um, and actually I think a really important game for Ireland to have had before playing this game, to have experienced the Aviva, know what the occasion is like and also have a game that they won so they can have a bit of confidence in the stadium as well. So I think that was quite important to them. Um, over 32,000 fans, which is brilliant. I still question the way the FAI sold the tickets. They started out trying to sell them in like a, a pack of Ireland versus England and Ireland versus Sweden because both games are in the Aviva, but I just thought it was a really weird way of doing it because you'd end up with people who couldn't go to the Sweden game then wouldn't go to the Ireland, uh, England game. I think if we're thinking about accessibility <laughs> and making it as easy as possible for people to um, get to the game or to want to come to the game, some of the decisions maybe didn't make the most sense. You know, you've already got your hands turned up tight behind your back a bit because you've only got four weeks to sell out the Aviva. And then to make it more tricky by ad sending packages first, which I understand the point of packages, two games for kind of like 70% or something, whatever it might be, but it will be a blocker for people who just want to go to England, Ireland, and, or Ireland, England. And um, then also I think there was only, a, there wasn't a very accessible link for the England fans to get into the England um, part of the, the arena either. So yeah, a bit of a weird strategy, I think, in terms of um, trying to sell out that out the thing, but it looked pretty full. Like, yeah. But you just think, like, maybe just making it a bit more accessible, you could have got that extra, what, yeah. 20,000 people. Nice idea to have the bulk, but don't make it your main selling point, which it kind of seemed to be. It should have been just pushing those yeah. um, tickets for the first month. And then also no tickets... On at, sale on the day. ...at the box office, so people can walk up to the Aviva and buy a ticket for the game, even though there were seats available. And that kind of baffles me, because, you like, there must be people who hear it on the radio on a... Tuesday morning go, oh, I'm free tonight. Maybe I'd love to go and see Ireland, England. That would be awesome. And then you you don't... I know that they... I don't know when it closed online, but you could buy online. But surely just making that accessible, like at England, Sweden the other day at Wembley, they were selling tickets at the box, box office right up to kick off. Yeah, and Aviva is like really central, um, really quite easy to get to from the city centre. So if people coming home from work decided actually, yeah, we'll pop along, it would have been feasible. So that was a bit annoying. But all in all, it was like... Over 30,000 was really 32,000. The noise was brilliant, particularly in the second half. People really got behind them. You could hear the England fans as well, which was brilliant. Um, <clears throat> you expected a bit more from Ireland in the first half. I think I did too. I think they gave England a little bit too much respect. I know they probably wanted to keep the first half close, but it was a bit too sitting back. They did the opposite of what Sweden did, and they let England's midfield dominate um, the play. And Kira Walsh was handed the... Lioness's player of the match after the game, quite rightly, I think. She was the best player on the pitch. But she was just afforded that freedom. And Sweden had kind of given Ireland a kind of a blueprint of what to do to make England struggle a little bit. And they just really didn't do it. Um, I think Little John and uh, O'Sullivan and, um, yeah, in that, in that midfield area, in that central kind of midfield area, were bullied in that first half a little bit. And they couldn't really get any sort of control on the ball or anything. And... As soon as they got the ball, they lost it. Not those two in particular, but Ireland as, in, as a whole. I do think when England went 2-0 up, that was the time for Eileen Gleeson to send Katie McCabe up into the front areas because she was at left wing back. And I, I was kind of just sitting watching the rest of that half going, like, you're doing the same thing. You're not changing anything. And it's leading to the same results. And, you know, England could have scored that second penalty. It wasn't <clears> a penalty, but... They could have scored mm -hmm. that second penalty. There was another couple of shots, I think, from Lauren James. Um, you know, that if she'd been more clinical with them, there, there were a couple of opportunities there. And you could have gone in at half time 4 0 down. And probably no one would have thought that would have been an unfair fair score at that point. So, um, I yeah, I just thought Eileen Beaton was a little slow to, to make this kind of change. They were sticking to, to the game up. plan. For the first half, it was like this is how we're going to play in the first half, and I was like, well, if it's not, if you're not achieving what you want out of playing like that, then it's not working. So you need to be able to adapt. Yeah, I think Kira Caruso said um, <clears throat> something like on off the ball um, in, in an interview in the mix zone it was like, we need to stop waiting to, to kind of get that first hit. That shouldn't be the time that we react. Yeah. We need to. That shouldn't be what sparks react. We need to sort of be playing at that level from yeah, yeah, yeah. the first whistle. Well, they sure they can do it, and I yeah. appreciate you can't do it for ninety minutes, but. Even if it is first 10 minutes, 
sit off a bit, have a break, go again in the second half. But at least some sort of proactive football in the first half, rather than as you, as she said, kind of sitting and waiting for. It. I think it was on the Koi gig pod actually. Um, Maeve de Burka maybe I think it was her talking about that midfield and because Ireland were playing a flat four it left O'Sullivan and Little John like they, they were under kind of they were England were basically able to dominate them because there was three midfielders yeah. for England so they were outmanned essentially yeah. in the midfield so anytime they got the ball it was very hard to keep we've got the energy and really like creative presence of Jess Park who we know what she's like this season she's playing number eight and we thought she'd start on Saturday on Saturday on Tuesday she was playing in the number eight and then backed up by Ella Toon who while maybe not in her best form at the moment is full of running and full of energy and you know those two two plus Kira Walsh kind of swarming around the two central players for, for Ireland <coughs> were what caused the problems yeah um, second half Ireland were better um, again it took a little while to get into it but made some changes I was surpri- really surprised she took off Kira Garusa I don't know whether it was a fitness thing but she felt like Think about Katie McCabe, and I don't. I know she is the best player on the team, and we often say like she'll drag the team through it. I think what I mean when I say that is that she's the motivator to get them hyped, right? So like to say to them, keep running. To say to them, I know you're tired, but we all have to run in this press. They all have. They have the talent to do it, and she's very good at energizing them. And I think Kira Caruso was brilliant in that front line, in that yeah. press, putting Hampton under pressure. There was a moment I think early on in the second half before Megan Campbell came on, which was the move that pushed McCabe forward where McCabe went literally from left wing back to left midfield to pressing Hannah Hampton at the front Mm -hmm. to coming back. And she was urging and urging and she was clapping on her teammates and saying, come on, come on, come on. And I think that's a pure example of of what you're saying right there is that she is is a standout player quality-wise and what she can produce. But the added part of Katie McCabe is she is that kind of player, a bit like a a Jess Fishlock or, you know, the kind of players that completely epitomise the energy of a team and mm-hmm. she will drag them up through their through to their that energy. energy and keep them at that yeah, level and get them that motivated and I think I was surprised I think I messaged you when Kira came off and I was like why is she doing that now Kira's just about getting into the game she just got she in she made like and two or three yeah. charges down on Ham- Hampton Hampton was looking a little rattled she kept clearing the ball out into the sidelines and I was like and then she took her off for Kiernan and I was just a little bit like I know you want to kind of stretch that line with Leanne Keenan, but at the same time, if something's beginning to work, why now? Yeah, um, I, because I felt like <clears throat> that was the start of the goal, of feeling like a goal was coming, um, and a lot of that was coming through Caruso, so I was surprised she came off. But Ireland are very good at riding that, that wave of momentum in a game where the crowd are really geeing them on. You know, it does put England under pressure. They don't often have to face that. You can see it sometimes in the World Cup where, you know, you feel a little bit rattled when the whole crowd is against you. Ireland were kind of trying to capitalise on that. The Megan Campbell throw was causing all sorts of problems. I can't remember which player it was we were talking to about that throw and why it's such a... why it messes with defence so much. And they explained that from a corner or a free kick, the ball comes into you at a different angle. It's coming from the ground up, whereas the throw-in is coming at you from a different angle. It's coming at you straight on. Um, so with such speed. speed as well. Yeah, and it's the second ball that you were touching on because I saw some people saying England were brilliant at dealing with Megan Campbell's throw-ins. I actually think they looked panicked and while they might have gotten ahead on the first ball, it was the second ball where they nearly aren't able to capitalise. Yeah, they, they did pretty well with it but they did look a bit like rattled by it. Um, I mean, I've seen defences handle it a lot worse. Oh yeah, 100%. Um, but like, yeah, no, it obviously causes problems and then it's, uh, especially when you stick... Lou Quinn up front. Big Lou, uh, number, Big nine. Lou number nine. Number um, nine. And you suddenly got that height presence. I think there was a picture, you took a picture of her um, and Leah having a hug after the game. And Leah was on tiptoes. Yeah. Getting up to hug her. So the height difference does help, especially get, when getting on, on the end of those kind of loopy, long throws. Um, yeah, I think they're causing the problems. I think the crowd really helps. Serena Vigman spoke about that after the game. She... She was like, the, the crowd kind of really backed them. She spoke about Megan Campbell's story. She was like, that throw is crazy. And then the the kind of um, momentum kind of shift in terms of like every time Ireland got forward, the, the roar got bigger. And I think that does ki- like really, really help to continue the pressure. England are great at capitalising on that yeah, as well yeah. at Wembley. Yeah. Um, I do think like Leah Williamson did make a big difference in that back line. She yeah. is a calming presence and, you know, England can look stressed at times and I think they would have probably looked more stressed if she hadn't been there because she is so level-headed level-headed and, and calm in those <clears> moments <throat> so I, I think she had a pretty good game for her first game back I messaged um, you in the first half and I was like 
Jess Park was making such a difference to that midfield yeah. in terms of connecting up the passes. They were so much more fluid. And Leah Williamson was making such a difference in terms of calmness and ball like distribution. Yeah. Her ball distribution was superb. I think the uh, one other thing that we should probably touch on, and I said this on social media, is that I think the second half was made by England making changes way too early. I think the first one was in the 55th minute and Ireland making changes way too late. And maybe if one or eight or both of the, those had happened at different times, we might have had a, a different story. I don't um, know, if they if England had scored that second penalty and were 3-0 up, I'd understand yeah, that. But, but 2-0 is It felt like the attitude was that you were 3-0 up. It was 2-0, it was a, a bit of a weird time <clears> to do it. And to take off Jess Park, who was kind of the glue in that midfield mm. alongside Kira Walsh, and bring on Frank Kirby, who... No, no, like, doubting I absolutely love Frank Kirby and what she can bring to a football field, but she is more of a, a well, a number 10 figure. And she, it kind of just broke down those relationships that had formed in that first half and were performing pretty well. Um, whereas I think in the, this, if you do that really early, they're suddenly having to learn how to play t- with each other again. And then Ireland get their backs up and they have one chance and then suddenly the momentum swings in the mm-hmm. other way. Um, so, yeah, I just thought that was a bit interesting from England's point of view to have made those changes on 55 minutes. Yeah, um, I think the Caitlin Hayes chance was probably, actually Caitlin Hayes had two opportunities. One was where Lou Quinn, bl- bloody defenders getting in, causing most of the chances. Anna Patton was up there as well, but Lou Quinn getting into the back post and, and getting a ball across the the box that no one was prepared for, including um, the two Irish players who just kind of missed out, couldn't get their feet right. And then coming in at the back post, Caitlin Hayes with the header, and I thought, that's in. Um, but it kind of ended up kind of at Hannah Hampton's body, but it was a super header. I'm not sure there was much more she could have done, but I kind of felt like when that didn't go in, I thought, okay, it's it's not going to happen. But all in all, I'm pretty pleased with the performance. I just wish we'd gotten a goal, but other than that, I'm really glad they weren't run over. I think, you know, I think maybe it was Katie McKay or Rusha Littlejohn or someone saying, if you told us we'd come out of these two games after playing France and England and only conceded three goals... Um, you know they they'd have been pretty pleased with that. You know they're they're a bit like the World Cup. They're in a really difficult group, but they're doing themselves pretty proud. Well, that's the main thing, isn't it? I think we've talked about it in a lot of places. You and I about you know the actually the beauty of them being in League A in this round is that there's no pressure. There's pressure, obviously. They want Expectation, to do well, yeah. But there's the the they can go out and they can see what they can do and they can try different things a little bit and they can. You know, build up some sort of experience against again against these top nations um, as they look to try and break up up the rankings, and that that's absolutely crucial for them. The difference between them and say Wales is that Wales had to do that in the first round, which then defined the qualifying for the Euros, and that was where the pressure was. Yeah. Whereas now, the it, you yeah. know the pressure is released because they're in that league A, and technically every member of league A can still qualify for the European Championships. Exactly. Um, so yeah, <clears throat> all in all, uh, a great occasion. Um, still friends, still love each other, still married. Um, no divorce quite yet. <laughs> but also, like you know Ireland, you understand Ireland, you understood the importance of this match. You're not a gloaty type of person. You never have been in any kind of sport. So um, it was very easy for us actually to deal with this match um, because you're not a cocky person. Even though your your team won the Euros and got to the final of the World Cup, and you're arguably the best team in the group or should be um so yeah it was a pretty easy one for us to deal with and even if we'd been run over by England I'd, I'd still be coming to you for support afterwards so giving you a big hug yeah <laughs> so all in all a good experience I think and um, the crowd that came over media wise enjoyed themselves as well and from what I heard the FAI treated the FA really well um, and they had a nice time as well so that was really good to hear um so we got to go back then and kind of reverse, I guess, to England, Sweden at Wembley and definitely a better performance at the Aviva from England. And they definitely kind of recognised their shortcomings in that Sweden game in the midfield because we saw Jess Park and Anatoum come in. We did. I think and it was, back, yeah. Of I mean, it was interesting because they kind of tried to fix the midfield problems from Sweden and they didn't really have the same problems <laughs> As the Sweden game, I think the problem for England in the Ireland game necessarily was probably that Russo going got marked out of the game by that back five, whereas the midfield were able to to operate. So, but against Sweden, yeah, it was it's where the midfield was where that game was won or lo- and lost. It was or drew, oh, yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, uh, but it, it's where they really really struggled. I think Georgie Stanway was uncharacteristically 
poor. Um, I think probably trying to do a little bit too much when in possession. Kira Walsh was marked out of the game. Peter Gerhardsen said that was a, a tactic of, of Sweden's was to mark Kira Walsh out of the game, and they did that. And it meant that they had a really energetic, aggressive press. Philippa Angeldahl in that midfield was just on them all the time. Mm. Gave England very little uh, time on the ball. Um, and when they did have time on the ball, they just played the wrong pass. Yeah, back to Sweden. But it was, no, but it also, all they turned backwards, and I think yeah. it, it was because of that Sweden press that they turned backwards, because they were a bit scared of being too audacious with it, maybe. Or open. Yeah, and yeah. I, I found it really frustrating. Like, as a photographer, uh, first half, I was down um, England's shooting end. And normally you think, OK, they're on the turn here, they're coming back, they've got won the ball over in their own defence, they're coming my direction, let's get ready. And Wembley's a big stadium, so there's a lot of ground between me and the start of the pitch. So even when they're halfway up the pitch, you're still kind of waiting a little bit for them to come just a little bit closer so you can get the shots. And they turn and go back in the direction and be like, oh, God damn it, I've just been waiting for you to come towards but, uh, me. Yeah. That's how I notice those things where I'm like, they're not up here. It feels like they have possession, but they're not up yeah, here a lot. They had that 70% possession or something. Um, but they just, yeah, I think it was because in the early stages they got caught on the hop a couple of times on the transition. And then when they were going forward, they were like trying to be a bit more safe with it. Whereas, and of course, Sweden's wingers are. You need to try and exploit like, well. those areas. I think they didn't use the width as much as they should. The central areas are so overloaded. Mm -hmm. And you saw when, you know, Lauren Hemp was down the right and Lauren James on the left, or vice versa, they had acres of space to run in, but the ball just wasn't quite getting out to them to do that kind of stuff. Um, I thought it was interesting how they started with Hemp on the right and James on the left. And I'm not and like we've had a lot of conversations about this within the press pack recently. I think maybe it's trying to lure Yona Anderson into kind of a full sense of security. She had Lauren Hemp's number. She was dealing all right with her. She was dealing okay with her. Like Lauren Hemp was obviously pretty patient, yes. but out on the right, she's not at her best. Yes. Um, but then as soon as they like within like thirty seconds or a minute of them swapping sides, that that's what created the goal for yeah. England is that Lauren James suddenly was out on the right hand side and found space and hemp and more space than yeah left. so um it was an interesting tactic i do yeah i do think yeah the defense wasn't the problem for england um the central defenders anyway i think that was kind of um i, th I did lotter woodmoy and alex Gromit, i thought performed pretty well given what they had to deal with yes i think the moments the fact that they had no protection in front of them. yeah i think the moments where they might have been caught out was not down to poor defensiveness but down to poor midfield work and then being isolated intentionally yeah. by the Swedes or because fullback had gone up too high and they were coming across to cover the space and I think generally they actually handled it pretty well yeah um but all in all yeah England come away um from both of those games now with four points second in the group France um on six only beating Ireland one nil and only beating Sweden one nil although they have had a player sent off and the manager sent off so they'll be yeah missing. they were not will miss the game at St George's Park <laughs> he won't be on the sidelines for that St George's um, Park St James's Park George, yeah sorry god don't drag us St up James's there. Park um <laughs> sorry about that St yeah he'll miss that game at St James's Park he'll be uh away from the sidelines for that one I'm sure he'll be there but um just can't be pitch side and uh, Besho, I think I th it was a double yellow, so she'll only miss one game. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, uh, a bit far, I guess, that one. Yeah, but I'm, I'm, you know, hearing from some of the Swedes in the post match, they kind of said they weren't at their game and that France deserved to win it. So I guess 1 0 is probably. I think Magda Eriksson got player of the match. That tends to tell you how a game has gone if, yeah. you know, a defensive player or a goalkeeper is getting player of the match. But England have got <laughs> France double header next, and I think they will be pretty. They'll be knowing that they had to improve, certainly, from this camp. But the fact that they've got four points on the board, they'll have wanted six, but they've got four points on the board. The fact that France haven't been scoring so many goals, you know, it's been two, two goals that they've scored. It's been tough. They've had tough battles. I think France were pretty disappointing in that Nations League final mm -hmm. as well. Um, so that will give England hope, I think, that they can at least get something, a win at home, and then you would hope for a draw away from home probably yeah um, so yeah I think Ireland will be taking on Sweden um, another tough game aren't they all at the Aviva as well um, so that'll be an interesting one I think look, they'll they'll look back at the qualifiers where they, they lost 1-0 to Sweden uh, in Tala through an on goal and they drew 1-1 with Sweden um, away that will give them confidence I think the two games will give them confidence they'll know that if they can stay in it they have a chance and I think it's just about 
find the right time to when to attack and when to sit back and because obviously they can defend well but that's not defending doesn't win your games um so you know they need to start trying to push forward a little bit which has kind of always been Ireland's issue but I do think they're getting better um so all in all I think we could take away from England and Ireland matches but let's look at the whole nations Wales Northern Ireland Scotland um Scotland and Northern Ireland both drawing in their first games nil nil respectively uh Wales run out four nil winners um great to see them banging in the goals and then in the the next <coughs> set of games um Scotland won one nil just Wales scored six and Northern Ireland three one against Bosnia um yeah I think it was a mixed pack for Scotland and Northern Ireland they would have been so disappointed. Northern Ireland hosting Malta and Scotland away to Serbia. And they would have been so disappointed about not being able to, to score, at least in that match, let alone bring away three points. They would have looked at those two two opposition and said, this is, if we want to make European Championships, this is who we have to beat. Um, so that would be a problem, I think, uh, much better from Northern Ireland in the second second leg going away and getting that win in Bosnia. We've been to Bosnia, it's not the easiest place to go where they do bank up at times and it's hard to break them down, but Northern Ireland did a good job against them. Um, Scotland only scoring one against Slovakia through a defender, Sophie Howard. Um, I do have my severe worries about Scotland because I do, I can't see the development there. They feel a little bit like they're going backwards, don't they? They gave uh, Pedro Martinez Losa um, a new contract sometime last year, I think in the middle of last year. And I, I questioned at the time why. And I, I still wonder why, because they're not showing much progress at all. And I know he keeps posting that it's been a great camp and everything like that, but um, you're not seeing the results on the football field. And I think at some point, especially if they don't get through qualification yeah. for the Euros... You're going to have to think about what's going wrong with the talent. Got the players. You know, when you have Aaron Cuthbert in that team, and you've got you've got good, good players. They might not all be the like, same level. They're not like all at maybe say England's level, but yeah. they're 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 all really good talent, and there's talent coming through, and you're not performing. Um, it makes you question that. Um, for Wales, first two games under Rianne Wilkinson. New manager bounce, but they've gone pretty well. Ten goals. Yeah, and um, they also had Sophie Ingle kind of retire the armband, not retire from international duty, but retire the armband. So that'll be kind of a, I guess, making it a real kind of fresh start for them. I think that's actually really like, I love to see that. It's really selfless from her, for, from her first of all, and it kind of speaks to the character that Sophie Ingle is because she is selfless. Yeah. Um, but I also think she still desperately wants to play for Wales, mm -hmm. and she will continue. You know, especially going if they've got a chance of getting to the Euros and, yeah. and going to that. And then, but I think she knows that for the progress of the team, it needs to feel to fresh. get younger. Yeah, well, to get younger player into it. She took it on at twenty three years yeah. old, and she said she's grown so much through that. So you would think that's you know. Um, yeah, and of course another Wales legend, Jess Fishlock, getting her hundred and fiftieth cap. She's just two goals off the overall. Wales goal scoring record men or women so no doubt she'll hit that soon this is probably going to be she said her last qualifying, qualifying and hopefully tournament um, but she's doing the business as ever um, Wales through and through so a good camp for them very good yeah. excellent of course we have to touch on you know speaking of not quite retiring armbands, but retiring, um, which surprised us all. We were sat in Dublin Airport yesterday, waiting for our flight, and we got the news through that Rachel Daly was retiring from international football, which is a big surprise. Um, she's 32, probably thought she maybe had a, another Euros left in her, um, but she's decided to hang up her boots. Um, and yeah, it made me definitely think back to all the memories that she's given England fans over the years, um, the impact she's had. I still can't wrap my head around the fact that She's somebody who can play at a world-class international level in two entirely... I mean, she plays lots of positions, but to be able to play like that at both ends of the pitch yeah. is incredible. I think, yeah, it's kind of a, a victim of circumstance, maybe where she finds herself right now, because I think for a long time she was England's left-back and she was a very quali quality left-back, mm -hmm. obviously. She, she performed to a high level, um, but that kind of sacrificed her, ability, her opportunities up front because England desperately needed a left back and there wasn't a lot of cover in that area. So um, I think she did that job so, so well over the years for England. Um, but the, the thing is now you've got a more like a, a natural left back in, in terms of Neve Charles coming through and she's performing to a high level for club as well. And so that probably naturally brought Rachel Daly into the forward position. But then you've already got 
Alessia Russo, who is a very, very different player to Rachel Daly. Rachel Daly is your traditional number nine. Alessia Russo is more maybe like a a false nine or a she's she's a, a nine, nine and a half and or a nine and a half, and she can play in the ten as well. She's that kind of link up forward that um, you like, and she can, she's very productive in an England shirt. But I think the way that she links the midfield for England to to Lauren Hemp and Lauren James or whoever's on the flanks as well. Um, and her movement in the box and her build-up play as well is um, second to none. So I think that that has probably um, hindered Rachel Daly's chances up front. Can I ask, though, because we can't just rely on one number nine if you're going to a major tournament. You need a good backup. Yeah, you do. And um, So to think, that's England's problem now. Yeah. Um, and My uh, point being, she probably could have gone to the Euros and still gotten game time. Yeah. Um, I would expect to see Bethany England back in at some point. Okay. I think... The reason why we've not seen Beth in England for a while is she had that hip surgery. Mm -hmm. She was out. She's still trying to think. I think get back to full fitness. Um, I know she came back at the start of the year, but you know it takes time after something as as big as that. Um, and she is kind of the forward that Serena Wiegmann turned to at the World Cup. You know when things weren't going well or th there's things needed to change. I also think Serena Wiegmann likes Lauren Hemp through the middle um, as well. She often goes to that as a backup plan. I agree. We need a different profile of forward but I do think for Rachel Daly she is the ultimate team player and she's proven that by her attitude on and off the pitch she's in terms of bringing people <clears throat> together but you can understand from her point of view well if she's not if she's getting 10 minutes in here and there maybe it's time that you know you focus on your domestic football she obviously wants to spend more time with her family as well and international football doesn't allow you to do that at all um, well, she made versatility cool because mm. that used to be something that was almost frowned upon and now it's so hugely beneficial to a team to have a player like that. Um, like, you could see Rachel Daly in the 23 and you just wouldn't know how she's going to be used and that's such a weapon. So um, thanks for the memories, Rach. Yeah. Good name, good career. And also a quick shout-out to the England Under-19s and Republic of Ireland Under-19s who have qualified this week for the European Championships this summer in Lithuania. So well done to them. And the under-23s oh who God. went to sea in um, Telford okay. yes, last week. And they finished out their European campaign with a victory So um, over Sweden. Yeah. Um, so they were undefeated in that first European league. So, yeah, big up the youth levels. Absolutely. I mean, might. We're going to try get out to some of the games in Lithuania. So watch this I am, space. So. So, well, Sophie is, obviously. <laughs> if you come to, I might be welcome. I might be invited. Um, okay, we're going to put our domestic hat on now, um, which I always find really hard. Like, I'm so... I can't do both. And, like, I find during the international break when we're getting, like, emails and requests and stuff for something to do with the WSL or the championship, I'm like, I can't. Can't think can't about it. it. <laughs> um, so we've got the FA Cup semi-finals coming up this weekend, of course. We've got Tottenham versus Leicester at the Hotspur Stadium, and we've got Manchester United versus Chelsea at Lee Sports Village. Um, we are doing the latter. Uh, so going all the way up to Manchester on Sunday morning um, for a big clash, of course. Both exciting games for different reasons, obviously. Um, Tottenham Leicester, historical game. Neither team have gotten to a semi final. We know one of them's getting to the final. Um, so that's going to be incredible for them. And then, of course, Manchester United Chelsea, a rerun of last year's final. United have never beaten Chelsea. Could this be their time? Chelsea have got a lot of balls in the air right now, a lot of things to juggle. They've got Barcelona coming on the horizon. Um, I got so confused about the Barcelona Chelsea game. Completely convinced myself that for some reason the home game was first because we were getting like requests and like interview stuff in about that game. So I'm like, oh God, that must be soon. Oh God, Barcelona's coming up soon in Stamford Bridge. And actually we're going to Barcelona first yeah, next, next weekend. weekend. Um, but yes, Chelsea have to fully focus first and foremost on FA Cup semi-final. How do you see these going? Who do you think is going to get through either side? Um, I think the Tottenham Leicester one is fascinating um, because there's going to be little between the two sides. Whenever they've met this season, it's been always a an interest, intriguing battle I guess and they're both on similar like journeys I guess this season in terms of what they're trying to do Leicester started the season with really an interesting style of attack and play same with uh, Robert Villaham and his his Tottenham side so and then they sort of all learned how to defend a bit better and then came back to attacking so it's going to be interesting how they can I enjoy both styles of football to be honest um, I think Bobby Ball is one of my favourite things to watch especially when it's in full flow and the game is going to be won 
and lost, as I said before, in the midfield area. So, um, or draw, well, no, it can't be drawn this time. So <laughs> it's going to be one or lost in the midfield area. Um, and then for Manchester United, Chelsea is going to be interesting. I think Chelsea will be fired up. Um, I think they will use the cup final as motivation. I, I think they have had Manchester United's number for so long now that that will give them confidence and that will give them an extra edge if they need any extra edge. I think Manchester United, the beauty for them is they come in fresh, I guess, although they have lost international like people to international, so they're travelling back. But um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how they match up. Obviously, Chelsea completely outdid them at Stamford Bridge. Um, was that at the beginning of the year? When the Lauren James was hacked through? I was so, there, it was great. I can't remember what it was, <laughs> Sophie. Um, I feel like Stamford Bridge is my second home at this stage. So I think Chelsea will feel confident mm-hmm. that they can do the job, but they can't be complacent about okay. it. Okay. And my player to watch from Manchester United is Lisa Nelson because I think she's come on leaps Oops. and bounds. You were going to say that. Okay, so that's coming up this weekend. We've got one WSL match, don't we? Arsenal-Bristol? Yes, on Sunday evening. At home for five. Arsenal? Uh, at home for... Yes, Arsenal. Um, okay, so that's one WSL match to look out for. The Championship is racing towards a very dramatic conclusion, as we say every time on this podcast. Um, I think there's, what, two or three games left? Yeah, three is th- three games left. You know, a couple of teams. Plus a couple of teams, yeah. Still have their games in hand. A few extra things. You've now, you've now, you're now leaning towards Palace, um, but we'll see how we go. Sunderland still top, then Palace, then Charlton, then Southampton, then Charlton. Yeah. Um, but Charlton and Palace, both with games in hand. Do yeah. I remember all that? Yeah. Bloody hell, check me out. No, no, it's around them. Um, <laughs> Birmingham so, are still floating around as well, and they're playing... Me. In fifth. They're playing Crystal Palace as well. Oh, in, okay. In that could be quite decisive. So. Anyway, lots to look out for. Anything else we're missing? What else is coming up, Sav? Um, not much. Just like five and a half weeks till the end of the season. Oh, my God. Six and a half if you include the Champions League final. It is the last block. It is the most exciting part of the intense. season. Intense. Most intense part of the season coming up. Um, yeah, it feels like it's flowing by. And I've made a promise to myself not to regret like things we haven't done this season so I'm I like gonna that. start being positive and we've done an awful lot so. we have done an awful lot this season I'm glad we decided yeah. at five weeks from the end to not regret and enjoy it because I'm the most self you know I'm the most self-critical person and I always want to be doing everything and I've decided to celebrate the wins and forget about the losses so brilliant what a lovely attitude to have um and one that I'm going to take away from this international window as an Ireland fan um there were no wins to celebrate <laughs> We did all right. Small wins. (laughs) Little wins. All right. Well, we're going to wrap it there. Um, Make sure, I always say this, you're liking and subscribing in case we don't do a podcast on Monday like we're supposed to when we drop it on a Thursday instead. Or if you're really lucky. First time this season, right? First time this season. We're going to celebrate the wins, guys. We've got one out. Um, But also in case we do a super sub app, which we sometimes drop in as well. So make sure you're across all of our socials. Um, And we will speak to you on Saturday where we will do another live. So if you want to send in any questions ahead of that, do. We would love to hear from you. But until Monday, which is a racing round very soon, we will see you all then.